On the 24th of March 1989, the oil tanker Exxon Valdez spilled about 37,000 tons of its 200,000 tons cargo of Alaskan crude into the waters of Prince William Sound, Alaska, in less than five hours. The ship had struck a reef and hold eight of its eleven cargo tanks, making it liable to capsize if refloated, but break up if its hull weakened further. Either way, all the cargo could have been lost into the unspoilt waters of this wild area. The remote location, the viscosity of the oil at the low temperatures in the area, and the size of the spill all made the cleanup very hard. At the peak of the cleanup, over eleven thousand people. 1,400 ships and 85 aircraft were involved, in an area where about 4,000 people normally lived. The large spill size, the remote location, and the type of oil all tested spill preparedness and response capabilities. Government and industry plans were unable to handle the spill. The cleanup and compensation payments cost around 10 billion dollars. And involved 20 years of court battles. And the Exxon Valdez spill was not the biggest oil pollution incident by some way. The official accident report said that prevention is the first line of defence. Avoiding accidents is the best way to deal with an oil spill. OPAR 90 includes rules that. Require oil tankers to be built with double hulls and have enhanced surveys. Requires bridge resource management training. Enforce hours of rest. And aim to ensure that ships' crews are well trained, having taken part in regular oil spill prevention drills. The report also said that preparedness must be strengthened. No one was prepared for a spill of this size. Contingency planning is needed to incorporate realistic worst-case scenarios. Adequate equipment and personnel to handle major spills must be ready. Adequate training is critical, and organizational responsibilities must be clear. Realistic exercises must be undertaken regularly. OPAR 90 requires that national, regional, and ship-specific oil spill response plans are produced. And that training programs should be approved, with exercises carried out at specified maximum intervals. Response capabilities must be enhanced to reduce the risks to the environment. OPAR 90 requires that ship operators ensure that they have substantial response capability available near their ships. Terminals also need spill response plans and response capability. U.S. national and regional response plans have been revised and integrated using a scalable incident command system. It was acknowledged that some oil spills may be inevitable. While oil is transported, there is always a chance of an oil spill. Accidents do happen. The chance of an accident can, however, be minimized. Some measures in OPAR 90 are aimed at preventing spills. More are focused on making sure their size is minimized and that they are cleaned up with minimum damage to the environment. The Exxon Valdez incident highlighted problems with the laws on liability and compensation when an oil spill occurs. OPAR 90 has resulted in a billion-dollar oil spill liability trust fund being set up. New laws place liability for costs firmly on ship operators and charterers. Proof that insurance is in place to cover standard liabilities has to be shown. The report recommended that the United States should ratify the Protocol to the Civil Liability for Oil Pollution Damage Convention, which established an international fund for compensation for oil pollution damage. This is still being considered. Federal planning for oil spills must be improved, said the report. OPAR 90 improved the national contingency plan, requiring better coordination of local, state, and federal plans. The worst-case scenario is now considered and addressed. Studies of the long-term environmental and health effects must be undertaken. 
The clean-up equipment used after the Exxon Valdez spill was not effective in certain conditions. In particular, it was hard to recover cold oil. The oil dispersants used were accused of causing environmental damage. The research demanded by OPA 90 has led to improved equipment and less harmful dispersants. Dispersant use is still a controversial subject. OPA 90 resulted in changes in government organisation. The oil spill liability trust fund was given the power to raise billions of dollars to pay for clean-up operations, from an oil shipment tax and from fines for oil pollution. Various government agencies are tasked with establishing area committees to develop local and regional oil spill contingency plans. A national response centre, operated by the U.S. Coast Guard, was set up to receive spill notifications, and to appoint federal on-scene coordinators to direct operations. The U.S. Coast Guard also has national and regional strike force teams. Trained in spill response, with spill response equipment stockpiles positioned around the coast. The Department of Justice has set up a whistleblower system to reward ships' crews who report instances of illegal discharges of oil on board their ships. Since the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, there have been no spills over one million gallons from ships. The proportion of oil spilled. Per million gallons shipped, is claimed to have reduced from an annual average of 14 gallons to 5 gallons, a 64% decrease. OPA 90 is a federal law. The U.S. legal system allows states to make other laws, provided they do not contradict federal laws. The result is that rules to prevent oil spills can vary from state to state. These can be tougher. Or have maximum liabilities that are higher than those set by OPA 90. For example, California and Alaska require higher insurance cover and separately approved contingency plans. Information about these local variations will be kept on board. OPA 90 affects almost all ships that enter U.S. waters, unless they are on innocent passage. That is, are passing through U.S. waters but not entering or leaving a U.S. port. Ships which are not on innocent passage and which are over 300 gross tonnage must show they can afford their financial responsibilities for clean-up liabilities. Non-tank vessels over 400 gross tonnage need to carry a vessel response plan. As do all tankers carrying oil in bulk or other hazardous substances. Vessel response plans must be approved by the U.S. Coast Guard. All ships in U.S. waters must report any oil pollution seen to the National Response Center immediately. The inland waters of the United States and the seas within its exclusive economic zone, up to 200 nautical miles offshore from the U.S. mainland and its island territories, are covered by OPA 90. Due to the federal nature of government in the U.S. and the widely varying conditions, from busy industrial ports, offshore terminals, and remote islands, the requirements are not uniform, and nor is the response organization. You need to be aware of which Coast Guard captain of the port area your ship is in, because you may need to contact different persons or organizations ashore when changing area. Operators of ships over 300 gross tons. Need to show they have enough insurance to cover potential cleanup costs if they have a major spill. When the U.S. Coast Guard are satisfied, they will issue a certificate of financial responsibility (COFR) and record this on a publicly available database. No printed copy is required to be kept. OPA 90 requires that the ship's operator. Appoints someone based in the United States to be their qualified individual or QI, with at least one alternate, as availability is required at all times, day and night. The ship operator must ensure that the qualified individual is familiar with their ship or ships. The QI is the link between the ship, 
the ship operator, and the U.S. government. The QI must have full authority to authorize action on behalf of the operator, including payment for whatever resources are needed to prevent an oil spill or clean one up. They must know the capabilities of oil spill removal organizations, salvage, and marine firefighting companies with which the operators have contracts. They must be familiar with the vessel's response plan, as well as those of the local and national governments. Your ship may use different qualified individuals in different areas because of this. While OPA 90 requires ships to be capable of cleaning up oil spilled onto deck, it is not normally possible for the ship's crew to deal with oil once it has entered the water. The ship's operator must sign a contract with an oil spill removal organization (OSRO) that will be quickly available to collect and dispose of a specified quantity of oil in an environmentally acceptable and safe way should their ship spill oil. As this requires equipment and personnel to be readily available locally, it may be necessary to use different OSROs when trading to different ports. The OSRO must have the capability to deal with the following legally defined spills within specified times: the average most probable discharge, the maximum most probable discharge, and the worst case discharge. The actual response times demanded depend on the location and accessibility of the spill. Click the buttons to see how these spills are defined. These small but common spills must be dealt with rapidly, so equipment and personnel must be nearby. More time is allowed to respond to these larger but less common spills. Some resources may be stockpiled further away from the port or coast. The resources to deal with a worst-case discharge are the greatest, and the time allowed to gather and deploy them is longest. To assist the qualified individual with his many responsibilities, the operator must assign personnel to form a spill management team. The team must be fully trained and large enough so they can oversee the spill response 24 hours a day. The team can be made up of the operator's employees and work from their office. Alternatively, the QI or OSRO may provide some or all of the spill management team. The responsibilities of the team are to deal with command and control of the incident, with particular regard to safety, liaise with government agencies, in order to coordinate clean-up operations. Air operations, including aerial surveillance, dispersant spraying, and movements of materials and people, providing information to the public in the media, environmental resource assessment, planning and logistics support, and arranging financial payments. An oil spill may be minimized or prevented by quick action to extinguish a shipboard fire, or by moving the ship from a dangerous navigational position. All tankers and other ships with a fuel oil capacity of over 400 cubic meters are required to have a contract with a company that can provide salvage and marine firefighting (SMFF) services in the event of an emergency. The services must be suitable for the size of ship, its fuel capacity, and the cargoes it carries, and be available within set times, depending on whether the ship is alongside, within the nearshore area, or offshore area. They include the following capabilities to carry out salvage of a ship: assessment and survey of the damaged ship, means of stabilizing the situation. And the ability to perform more specialized salvage operations. 
To help the crew deal with the fire on board, the SMFF service will provide remote assessment and planning and external fire suppression resources. As maximum response times are laid down, varying according to the ship's location, the services must be on standby locally and different providers might be used in different areas. The ship operator must supply a copy of the ship's fire plan to the contractors. Click the button to see the times. Operators of oil tankers must have pre-arranged prompt access to computerized shore-based damage, stability and residual structural strength calculation programs to assist with salvage attempts. Other ships must be able to access shore-based strength and damage stability guidance. Finally, operators of tankers of any size and of other ships over 400 gross tons will have to write a vessel response plan. This has to describe how a pollution or potential pollution incident will be dealt with. The plan must be submitted to and approved by the US Coast Guard before the ship arrives in the OPAR-90 area. We will examine vessel response plans in more detail in the next chapter. A ship found not to have a COFR may have to pay a fine of up to $37,500 per day of violation. The ship may also be seized and sold. A ship without a vessel response plan valid for the area cannot enter a U.S. port, and the Coast Guard can prevent port entry. If a ship is already in port and the vessel response plan is found to not be valid, then oil transfer operations will be stopped and the ship may be detained. Either of these will probably result in commercial penalties, as the ship will fail to deliver its cargo as planned. Similar penalties may be imposed if the operator, their employees or contractors do not meet the requirements of OPAR 90 or the approved vessel response plan, such as not carrying out exercises and training as scheduled or carrying the wrong type of cargo. If one of the ship operator's employees or contractors is found to be guilty of gross negligence or willful misconduct or the violation of an applicable federal regulation, in particular failure or refusal to report an incident or provide all reasonable cooperation to or comply with an order issued by responsible officials, then the operator's legal limit on liability can be removed. Protection and indemnity insurance will only cover up to the standard liability limits. This could result in huge financial costs which are not covered by insurance, perhaps bankrupting the firm. Here is a reminder of what you have learned in this chapter. The ship operator must get a certificate of financial responsibility proving that the ship is adequately insured against pollution costs, and arrange for a qualified individual to be available to deal with a pollution incident. They will lead the spill management team in using the salvage and marine firefighting services and other technical assistance contracted by the operator in order to avoid restrictions in trading and the many penalties that can be imposed. Tankers of any size and all other ships over 400 gross tonnage must have a vessel response plan on board before entering OPAR 90 waters. This may be a separate document or put together with the ship's shipboard oil pollution emergency plan to make an integrated pollution plan. A vessel response plan must be consistent with the US national response plan and relevant local response plans. The ship, operator and qualified individual must have a copy in English. Copies in other languages used by the crew may also be on board. Move to the next page to see what it will contain. 
In the front will be general information and an introduction, a table of contents, and a record of changes page to record information on plan reviews, updates, or revisions. The ship's identification details, the name, address, and procedures for contacting the ship's owner or operator, and a list of the captain of the port zones within which the ship intends to handle, store, or transport oil. There will be procedures saying how to make notifications of a discharge or substantial threat of a discharge of oil, including the relevant contact details, the order of priority of those to be notified, whether shipboard or shore-based personnel are to contact them, and the information required by those parties to be notified. The biggest part of the plan will contain the procedures to be followed to mitigate, that is, to minimize, the effects of spilled oil or noxious liquids following certain accidents. Initial actions will be similar to those found in a SOPEP, but the extra response capability available to ships in OPAR-90 waters will result in extra actions being available. Unlike a SOPEP, the plan must include Procedures for the crew to deploy any discharge removal equipment provided. For internal transfers of cargo. And for ship-to-ship -ship transfers of cargo in an emergency. In addition, there will be procedures and arrangements for emergency towing. The location, crew responsibilities and procedures for use of shipboard equipment which may be carried to mitigate an oil discharge. The crew responsibilities, if any, for record keeping and sampling of spilled oil, including safety precautions. The crew's responsibilities, if any, to supervise the shore-based response. Where to get advice on damage, stability and hull stress. The location of ship plans necessary to perform salvage, stability and hull stress assessments, together with contact details for shore-based computer calculations. There will be a section containing the organisational structure that will be used ashore. It includes the roles and responsibilities for each oil spill management team member, together with the procedures for coordinating the shore responses. The following will be covered. Command and control. Public information. Safety considerations for the ship, the environment and the people involved. Liaison with government agencies. Spill response operations, planning, logistics support, and finance. An up-to-date list of contact details for the persons and organizations that may be called upon during an oil spill emergency for the areas of operation will be attached. These will include details for the relevant officers of the U.S. Coast Guard, the qualified individual and alternate qualified individual, the ship interest contacts such as the owners or operators, classification society and insurers, the ship's local agent, and, if relevant to the plan, the people to contact at the various shore contractors. The plan must set out the training to be carried out by persons given responsibilities in the plan. This includes the ship's crew, the qualified individual, and the spill management team. Initial and refresher training is needed, with records of at least the last three years kept at a specified location in the United States. Both announced and unannounced exercises must be planned to check everyone is prepared for a spill. Some exercises are required by law to take place at maximum intervals. For example, once a year, the spill management team must carry out a tabletop exercise. At least once in three years, this must assume a worst-case discharge scenario, the loss of all the ship's fuel or hazardous cargo into the water in bad weather. 
and at least once every three years, an exercise of the whole response plan must be carried out. But all parts of the plan do not have to be exercised at the same time. Every year, at least one unannounced exercise must be carried out. Plans must be reviewed at least once per year, and this review noted in the change record. A record of all changes must be kept. Changes may require reapproval of the plan. The plan will need to be resubmitted for approval before the end of its five-year validity, and in other specified circumstances, such as a change in owner or OSRO contractor. The U.S. Coast Guard is organized into different operating areas, known as Captain of the Port (COTP) zones, and subdivided into sectors. For each Captain of the Port zone where the ship will operate, there needs to be a list of the approved operating locations, the volume and type of oil cargoes which can be dealt with, the specific qualified individuals. Oil spill removal organizations, salvage and marine firefighting contractors, and aerial surveillance providers, and the emergency procedures to be used within that zone. Even inside a captain of the port zone, some areas may be off limits to your ship. Unusual conditions may be defined within some captain of the port zones, which make the ship's oil spill removal organization ineffective. Perhaps the wave height may be too high for oil booms, or the location may be too remote from the cleanup equipment stockpile or firefighting ship to reach quickly enough. Finally, there will be some information about the ship or ships to which the plan applies. This will contain relevant plans showing the ship's layout, its damage stability information, tank capacities. And the cargo and bunker piping system. There will also be the calculated sizes of the maximum most probable discharge and worst case discharge. Here is a reminder of what you have learned in this chapter. A vessel response plan is required by all tankers and other types of ships that are over 400 gross tons. It will contain similar information to a SOPEP, but with different notification procedures. Increased emphasis on shipboard mitigation of pollution, and greatly increased help available from shore contractors. Training and drill requirements are set out in more detail, as is the need for regular plan review and re-approvals. Geographical annexes are needed to cover the varying requirements around the coast. OPA 90 requires all ships to carry a specified minimum amount of cleanup equipment, depending on their size and type. The equipment will include absorbents for soaking up oil, scoops, shovels, and buckets, emulsifiers for deck cleaning, a portable pump, scupper plugs, and protective clothing for the crew. During bunker or liquid cargo transfer operations, the equipment must be ready for immediate use. All ships must have a fixed container or enclosed deck area under or around each fuel oil or bulk lubricating oil tank vent, overflow, and fill pipe. There are extra requirements for tankers. Click on the button for more information. One of the most important changes resulting from OPA 90 was the requirement for tankers to have double hulls. The U.S. led the way by requiring these, but U.S. rules are now the same as those of MARPOL for ships trading internationally. Oil tankers must be able to transfer cargo from tank to tank. If cargo pumping systems cannot do this, then portable pumps, hoses, etc., must be supplied. Audible or visual high-level alarms are needed in each cargo tank. To further minimize the risk of spills, tankers must be fitted with savalls or drip trays under cargo manifolds. Combings must be fitted around the cargo area, 
or any other place where cargo may spill. A means for them to be safely emptied must be provided. The ship's vessel response plan will contain a list of geographic areas for which it was approved, and where the operator has contracted oil spill response and other emergency assistance. Ships cannot visit a port outside the approved area unless special permission is obtained. Permission will be given for one visit only, and an amended vessel response plan will need to be submitted and approved before another visit is allowed. Ships working cargoes at shore terminals can rely on the terminal's response plan and clean-up equipment to be available. Special arrangements will need to be organised if a ship-to-ship -ship transfer is to be undertaken at sea. The OSRO will have to ensure that resources can still be made available within the required times. Before entry into the OPAR 90 area, the master must ensure that records show that all drills and other checks required by OPAR 90 are up to date. The vessel response plan will have a schedule for these, such as oil pollution prevention equipment maintenance. Any pollution equipment specified in the vessel response plan must be regularly inspected and maintained in good order, with records kept for at least three years. Plan reviews and reapprovals. Vessel response plans must be reviewed annually, with any amendments submitted to the Coast Guard for information or approval. Any significant change to the ship, its management or trading pattern may also cause reapproval to be necessary. Training for the ship's staff consists of two key elements. Prevention training, to prevent a spill by following correct procedures and knowing how to operate the ship. Closely following the ISM system will contribute to spill prevention. And response training, so that any emergency is dealt with quickly and effectively. Training in the use of clean-up equipment would be part of this. Crew who are given new responsibilities as identified in the Vessel Response Plan, must be properly trained before starting their duties. This should be normal under ISM procedures. The Vessel Response Plan will identify those roles for which crew members need special training and contain a training program for those not already trained through previous work experience. Records of training over the last three years must be kept. Drills provide training and test the effectiveness of previous training. To ensure the crew are prepared for an effective oil spill response, some drills are specifically required by OPAR 90. The Vessel Response Plan will contain the company's drill schedule. The following exercises, or drills, are required as a minimum. Qualified Individual Notification Drills Emergency Procedures Exercises Remote assessment and consultation exercises. And unannounced drills. All parts of the vessel response plan are required to have been tested within a three-year period. A major exercise is not required, provided it can be shown that the individual parts have all been tested during the three years. Make sure your records clearly show what has been practised. Records of the drills should be kept on board for examination by the Coast Guard for at least three years after the drill has been conducted. Click on the buttons for more information on each drill or exercise. Qualified individual notification drills must be held every three months. The ship must make contact with the qualified individual by one of the means in the vessel response plan and get confirmation that it was received. Emergency procedures exercises are to be carried out at least once every three months. These are to confirm that the crew are familiar with the initial actions required to minimise the spill in the event of a collision, transfer spill, fire or similar accident. Remote assessment and consultation exercises are also to be carried out every three months. 
the salvage and or marine firefighting resource providers are to be contacted to ensure that salvage or firefighting advice can be obtained within the maximum allowable one hour. The ship operator is required to carry out an unannounced emergency procedures drill with the ship every three years. In addition, ships may be brought into unannounced drills when the Coast Guard tests their own response plans. The VRP notification is required for the same reasons as for a SOPEP. Notification must be made when there is a discharge or a possibility of a discharge resulting from operation of or damage to the ship or its equipment or for the purpose of securing the safety of the ship or saving life at sea. An operational discharge exceeding MARPO requirements. Any oil or noxious liquid has gone overboard or has the potential for doing so. Note that oil on water can be difficult to quantify. The US interpretation is that a visible sheen on the water is evidence of an illegal discharge. Remember, if someone else reports a sheen from your ship and you have not, the master, owner or operator can be prosecuted. Failure to report quickly may be considered gross negligence, with resultant removal of limits on costs and fines. The quicker the notification is made, the faster the cleanup can begin. This will result in less damage and lower cleanup costs. When in doubt, notify. The reporting procedure will be in your vessel response plan. In general, the National Response Center in Washington, D.C. must be notified immediately. If direct communication with the National Response Center is impossible, then the relevant Coast Guard sector office might be used instead. Depending on the location of the ship, the state authorities may also need to be informed quickly. Failure to do this can make the master liable to criminal prosecution. The qualified individual must be notified so they can send assistance to the ship. Someone, probably the qualified individual, needs to inform the local Coast Guard captain of the port, the local state authorities, the ship's agent and the oil spill removal organisation. The ship's operator will need to be notified. The ship's operator would typically be responsible for informing the class society, flag state and the ship's insurers. In view of the possible effects on the company's reputation and court proceedings, the ship operator will probably contract a public relations expert to handle media inquiries. Include as much information in the spill report as possible, so that everyone knows what they are dealing with. Send regular updates, as directed by your vessel response plan, so all involved know what is happening now. Immediately begin recording the sequence of events, as required by your response plan. It is important that you have records to show that every step was taken to minimise the effect of the spill, and to prove, if necessary, that the ship was not grossly negligent. As soon as a spill from your ship is discovered, the crew must begin to mitigate, that is, reduce the impact of, the pollution. The techniques for doing this are in the response plan and will be similar to those in the SOPEP. In general, prevent spilled oil entering the water if possible. Use absorbents, pumps, etc. to prevent oil going off the deck and into the water. Stabilize the situation. Ensure that the spill does not get worse, particularly if the ship has been damaged. Shore assistance is available to help assess the strength of the damaged structure. Reduce the flow of the spill. Shut valves on leaking pipes or tanks. Transfer oil out of leaky tanks if possible. Clean up the oil if possible. Do not use oil dispersants without permission as they can make the effects worse. Mechanical removal is required where practicable. Contaminated materials must not be allowed to cause secondary pollution and must be sent for proper disposal. Make sure that suitable health and safety procedures and equipment is used 
so that personnel are not hurt while dealing with the spill. One accident is enough. Your qualified individual will contact the oil spill response organization named in the vessel response plan to start a cleanup. They will have equipment nearby, but will need time to get organized and mobilized. If the spill is large, they may have to ship in more equipment from neighboring areas. Local stockpiles of government equipment can also be made available. Each area which has a contingency plan will have a Federal On-Scene Coordinator, FOSC, identified, who will become involved if an incident is thought serious. The On-Scene Coordinator will generally oversee the effectiveness of the Vessel Response Plan, but has the power, in exceptional circumstances, to demand that you follow their instructions instead of your response plan. The Federal On-Scene Coordinator will closely monitor your qualified individual's management of the cleanup. The Coordinator can call on additional resources, such as Coast Guard Strike Teams. There are local and national teams trained in handling spills and who have a stockpile of firefighting and cleanup equipment. National and regional response teams, made up of 16 government agencies with emergency response experience. An environmental response team from the Environmental Protection Agency. And scientific support coordinators from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. If the ship has major damage, following a fire, grounding or collision, for example, then the help of the Salvage and Marine Firefighting Service named in the response plan will be needed. The qualified individual will normally arrange this. Firefighting advice will be available fairly quickly, with shoreside firefighters available to board your ship and assist you. Firefighting vessels and other firefighting equipment can be brought to the scene. Help with assessing the strength and stability of the damaged ship will be made available, so that informed decisions can be made about the condition of the ship, such as Will the supply of more firefighting water cause the ship to become unstable? Will it capsize or sink if pulled off a reef or away from another ship? Will it break up if the weather gets worse? Can it be lightened without causing it to break up or capsize? A tug based in the area, suitable for towing the ship to safety, will have been identified in the response plan. People who can work out a salvage plan for your ship, heavy lift cranes and other specialised salvage equipment will be made available if necessary. For underwater damage surveys or emergency repairs, a diving service company nearby will be contracted to attend. Suitable ships or barges with necessary pumps, hoses, etc. for lightning will be available. Some means of recovering oil from the seabed will be supplied where the water depth is suitable for recovery. All the above have to be available within maximum times, dependent on the location of the casualty and the environmental sensitivity of the area. Following any spill, the effectiveness of the response must be reviewed by the relevant parties, including the ship's crew. The experiences of the ship's crew during drills may also be sought as part of the company's annual review. Failure to notify the authorities of an oil spill emergency can result in personal fines, imprisonment or both. The maximum penalty for failing to notify the appropriate federal agency of a discharge is $250,000 for an individual and up to five years in prison. The maximum penalty for violations is $250,000 and 15 years in prison. Failure to cooperate with or comply with orders from the U.S. authorities in relation to oil spill exercises or actual incidents can also lead to prosecution. Note that if a report of oil on the water is investigated and found to have come from your ship, but you did not make the report, the ship operator can be found grossly negligent. Unlimited liability then applies. 
This could put the shipping company out of business and you out of work. Here is a reminder of what you have learned in this chapter. Opar 90 requires spill cleanup equipment to be kept on board, maintained, and ready for use. A drill schedule is specified to make sure the plan and equipment are effective. The vessel response plan lists the people to notify and their order of priority. It has instructions for managing the spill on board and the shore resources available. The plan needs to be regularly reviewed to ensure the crew are not prosecuted.